Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Hey, aloha, and welcome to Stand Energy Man on Think Tech Hawaii, where community matters and where your opinion counts. So you ought to be talking to us, especially if you have questions about what we're talking about on Stand Energy Man. It's been a busy week. I was just telling my guest Ryan that I'm really tired this week because we uh, spent the whole week at the Hilton uh, with the Verge Energy Conference, which was a really great conference. It's getting better and better every year. Uh, a lot more folks coming, a lot more great topics, and much to my pleasure, hydrogen. We only had one uh, panel session with hydrogen, which I was involved in, but hydrogen kept coming up uh, on the main stage and in several of the breakouts, uh, which tells me people are starting to finally wake up to uh, to hydrogen, and that's good because it plays a. I think it plays a critical role in Hawaii's future, and we'll talk more about that with uh, with Ryan when we uh, we get into our discussion on sustainability today, but. Um, I'd also like to talk about another thing that, that is also becoming more and more common in the lexicon of um, clean energy, and that's the word sustainable or sustainability. And, um, you know, it's funny because, you, you know, just like microgrids, it seems like everybody has a definition of microgrids and they're all just a little bit different. But one of the best definitions of sustainability that I've come across was actually presented uh, at Earth Day Texas about two years ago, maybe three years ago, by Robert Kennedy Jr., who's Bobby Kennedy's son, who's an environmental lawyer. He's actually been on TV a couple times in the last week or two. And his definition of sustainability was, if it doesn't make economic sense from the time you produce the object or technology or product until the time you finish its life, that means it goes to the landfill or it gets recycled or whatever it is. You have to have a plan and a financing, financing plan for that whole spectrum or it's not sustainable. And I think that's really a critical element that we're missing, because the first thing that I get hit with when people talk to me about, you know, what, how, how is hydrogen uh, in terms of affordability, how much does it cost, how much does a kilogram of hydrogen cost, they, they get stuck on the here and now and the today, the what it costs now. And we have to look at what it costs when we're doing it at scale and what's the investment it's gonna to take to meet the investment that we already have in fossil fuels. It's gonna take the discussion of, well, where does your raw material come from? Are you, are you harvesting oil from the ground like we are now where you didn't make the oil, you know, Mother Nature made the oil, you're just pulling it out of the ground. Um, and, the, and the contrast of that to hydrogen, which is an atom that changes from water to hydrogen and oxygen back to water. And I mean, you don't lose it, it's just energy in motion. So we need to look at the full spectrum, including, especially on things like batteries uh, and solar panels, the end, light, end of life. You know, at the end of the useful life of these technologies, what do you do with them? Sh what should we do? And um, I guess the, and I'll, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that because it's all part of being sustainable. And so before we get started, I wanna show a, a video. Uh, again, this is because I'm trying to indoctrinate all of you thoroughly in hydrogen. Um, it's a video we produce locally, and it's really short, but I'd like to run it for a second. So roll tape, Robert. Hydrogen, the simplest element, and also the most abundant. Hydrogen makes up roughly 75% of all mass in the universe. Hydrogen also powers most of the stars in our universe, so it's only fitting that it has come to be recognized as a viable alternative energy source. And we need alternatives, because fossil fuels are problematic. They're messy, dirty, expensive to obtain, and not secure. And they're limited. Hydrogen, on the other hand, is everywhere. Hydrogen can be produced from a wide variety of sources, including water itself, using other renewable energies. That means it's clean, really clean. As a zero emission fuel source, the only byproducts are water, heat, and electricity. Easily transported, hydrogen can be stored and distributed on a large scale as either gas or liquid. As a fuel, hydrogen itself is very light. In fact, hydrogen is 472 times more efficient by weight than lead acid batteries. And it isn't just for transportation. Hydrogen can also effectively produce and store energy for power grids. Hydrogen gas is transformed into energy within a fuel cell. 
As hydrogen passes through a fuel cell, electrons are released and an electrical current is produced and captured for use. Electric vehicle motors powered by hydrogen fuel cells are twice as efficient as gas or diesel engines. They can travel farther distances than lithium batteries, especially in heavy vehicles, and can last for decades. Hydrogen-powered fuel cells are scalable to buses and commercial fleets such as trucks, trains, ships, and aircraft. Fuel cells allow for fast, easy refueling, and hydrogen can be easily adapted to current refueling stations, making it a convenient fuel source for everyone. It is a proven, safe, clean, and efficient energy source currently in use worldwide. Hydrogen is everywhere, including our clean energy future. So thanks for uh, watching that video again with me, but um, you're going to see it more. I'm going to keep showing it from time to time because, you know, when it comes to being sustainable, um, I'm pretty well convinced that hydrogen is going to be one of your best ways to store energy in a sustainable manner. Uh, most of the components that you use to build tanks for hydrogen, uh, use in, in fuel cells to uh, produce electricity from the hydrogen, uh, and even the end product of water that comes out uh, the, the tailpipes of vehicles when you run the fuel cell or stationary fuel cells if you're using it on land is water. It's sustainable. You're basically taking that hydrogen atom and running it through a cycle where it goes from, from water back to water and that's what nature does with it anyway. If you have a leak and it goes in the air, it makes clouds. So you can't get a whole lot more sustainable than that. So I'm really bullish on hydrogen and I'd like to keep showing that video to you folks from time to time just to remind you about that aspect of hydrogen. So welcome, Ryan. Thanks for being here again Thanks, on Dan. the third Friday of every uh, month to help us wheel through the complexities of electrical engineering and the technical side of some of this stuff that we're dealing with. And we started last month talking sustainable. You know, what, what Hawaii's gonna look like in 2045 when we're supposedly all green on the grid and hopefully a lot of our transportation is all green. Um, and for most of us, that means that whatever transportation remains on the highways, whether they be fleet buses or, or fleet vehicles or personal uh, transportation, you know, privately owned vehicles, that they're not gonna be internal combustion engines. Um, we may have some remnants of uh, hybrid vehicles left, but primarily they're all gonna be some kind of electric vehicle, hydrogen fuel cell, battery plug-in, you know, something like that. And so we, we're gonna be putting a, a pretty big demand on the grid. And uh, that's one of the things I'd like to kind of focus on today. And that, and maybe we could even start off with uh, looking at what we use today for transportation, like oil. And in this line of sustainability and, and, and that cost of sustainability, um, you know, how oil's kind of evolved from the time we first started pulling it out of the ground when it's pretty plentiful to what technologies we have to use today to get it and what's the return on investment with some of our oil. Um, so I think you've done a little bit of research on that. What's, what's it like? What does it look like? Sure. So we got a couple questions there lined up. Um, converting the existing transportation energy use and moving it to the grid is a natural progression that we're doing right now. That, that amount of energy consumption is relatively high compared to what we, we currently use. So that's one thing we'll, we'll need to, to think about and talk about maybe in the second half of the show today. The first part is about where we are today and about sustainability, uh, the transportation use, and let's just say energy use in general. So oil, from a sustainability point or from an economic return, let's consider an energy in, energy out conversation. If you're gonna go out, you wanna heat your house, maybe you're going, you're gonna go out and get some firewood, you gotta go out, Find, find a tree, maybe you're chopping it down, chopping it up into smaller pieces, bringing it to your house, putting it in, and then you even have a little more energy expended to start the fire. All of that sum of energy that you spent going out there getting that wood, let's total that up, and then compare that against the amount of heat that your, the firewood puts into your house. That's what I mean by energy in, energy out. Early on, um, you put a little pipe in the ground, a bunch of oil comes out, that was really easy. And not a lot of energy going in, a lot of energy coming out. That was something on the order of 100 to 1. Oh. So it's, 
it, it makes sense on why we, as a civilization, gravitated towards that really quickly because it was, it was a, really cheap. It was just cheap. It was a lot of energy for, for a little bit of effort. Uh, effort. Yeah. That has since come down um, for a multitude of reasons. One, it, it's either harder to find or we're having to invest more energy into finding where the pockets are. Uh, for drilling, maybe or a lot more drilling that that doesn't turn out to to give us any oil would right. would go against that energy and energy out. Yeah, equation. it comes against it. You got to find it first. Got to find it. So that'll take a hit, and then our environmental concerns on how what we're doing to treat the whole process, the mm -hmm. drilling, what we're going to do when we get it out, um, what we're you know how we're treating the refinery and then how we're burning all of that. If, if environmental clean, cleansing that we do on, on yeah. the product is taking a hit on our efficiency. In, including containing spills and things like that, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Right. So I think now we're somewhere between 50 and 60 or 50, 70 um, energy in, energy out ratio. Natural gas, uh, maybe a little bit higher. Coal sits around 50. Um, and then you start to compare that to our renewable technologies being solar and wind, just from energy in, energy out standpoint. Solar is somewhere around 10 to 1, and wind at about 20 to 1. Uh, these are rather rough numbers, but it, it, does, it does show that there is a, a hit that you take on energy just to, to be sustainable. But now you're in that sustainability, you're, you're in that renewable um, place where over time the marginal cost of energy should continue to drive mm -hmm. down because you're, you're going to keep on getting it. So. Um, and the sun's going to take a long time before it burns out compared to um, whatever whatever we're consuming from the earth. Um, correlating that into transportation now, if we want to get off of oil um, or our carbon-based burning vehicles, we will take a little bit of a hit. But the energy consumed is still the same. The vehicle still needs, from my standpoint, X amount of KW to move, whether that was right. burned by fuel, uh, gasoline or... Or whether it's electricity coming out of a battery. Coming, exactly. So we can separate those equations relatively quickly and, and add up the amount of energy we're consuming on the transportation side right now and then start planning that this is going to shift into the electric grid because it is a very efficient place to to move and store energy sustainably, um, it is a natural progression of, of where that's going to happen. And then I forgot exactly the next step that I'm going to go to. <laughs> so you're going to have to remind me where you're we're asking headed on the old guy. Yeah. Well, so we've got that piece of it, uh, and, and the time component is also really important because, you know, when you take that that barrel of oil out of the ground, and it used to be pretty cheap to do, now it's getting a little more pricey as we go into like fracking and shale oil and things like that and you know oil sand oil and you're you're having to work a lot harder to pull it out but then there's the time component you know you you put pv on your roof uh, or you invest in a wind turbine uh, a big wind turbine to provide electricity and it has an operating cost um, the operating cost of wind turbines kind of high relatively speaking to solar um, and then how long do they last um, gives you a, a duration that your return on investment, which is the other, the other piece of the, uh, the dollars and cents, you know, the, the solar starts to make sense. It may cost you, you know, a lot more to make a solar panel and put it on your roof, but then it, it gives back for a lot longer time. Um, and then at the end of life, are there, are there any major issues with solar in terms of like when solar panels are done, they're most people never handle actually the, the solar cell itself. Very fragile. It's like an eggshell, and it just crumbles if you if you just you know, push on it a little bit. It just cracks into pieces. Are there any end of life issues with solar panels that um, we haven't overcome, or we, we can we recycle the silicon? Can we, you know, can we remake the new solar cells out of the old ones? That's a good question. I'm not that familiar with the recycling or the end of life um, handling of of solar right now. Um, but I'm going to look into that. Maybe okay. we can dive into that a little bit next okay. time. Uh, there is a lifespan, though. I mean, solar, it just, it's just not going to last forever. Um, most things man produces mm -hmm. does, does not. So um, it is something to consider, and, and I'm going to answer that next time, okay. if possible. Okay. Well, in the meantime, we're going to take a quick break here, and we're going to look at some of the other Think Tech shows that are on this weekend. We'll be back with Ryan in 60 seconds. 
Pete McGinnis Mark. And every Monday at one o'clock, I'm the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Research in Manoa. And at that program, we bring to you a whole range of new scientific results from the university, ranging from everything from exploring the solar system to looking at the Earth from space, going underwater, talking about earthquakes and volcanoes, and other things which have a direct relevance, not only to Hawaii, but also to our economy. So please try and join me one o'clock on a Monday afternoon to Think Tech Hawaii's Research in Manoa, and see you then. I'm Jay Fidel, Think Tech. Think Tech loves energy. I'm the host of Mina, Marco, and Me, which is Mina Morita, former chair of the PUC, former legislator, and uh, Energy Dynamics, a consulting organization in energy. Marco Mangelsdorf is the CEO of ProVision Solar in Hilo. Every two weeks, we talk about energy, everything about energy. Come around and watch us. We're on at noon on Mondays, every two weeks on Think Tech. Aloha. Hey, welcome back to my lunch hour again. Snap Energy Man here on Think Tech Hawaii with uh, my recurring guest, my favorite electrical engineer in the state of Hawaii, Ryan Wobbins from Burns and McDonald. And uh, one of the reasons he's my favorite is because he really gets down and dirty with grids and microgrids. I mean, that's kind of like his his core function in, at Burns and Mac is really understanding the relationships and trying to help folks design the best system they can, whether it's grid tied or whether it's grid independent, um, and taking all the different variables into account. And, and that's important. Um, we've talked about it before where not all batteries are the same. There's, I mean, just in, in liquid battery, in, uh, in um, wet cell batteries, there's like deep cycle batteries if you have a boat and it's gonna be on your electrical system, or a heavy cranking battery if you're, you're in a vehicle and you need to crank a starter motor up. Two different technologies, and if you don't use them the right way, you just wear the battery out a lot faster and have to replace it that much sooner. Um, so you have to match the right technologies, uh, even within these microgrids and, and on the big grid, um, to help complement and make sure you have the right mix to, to handle your issues. Some systems have a heavy surge requirement, some systems have very little surge requirement, and you can use different technologies to cover those, um, cover your spinning reserve and things like that. So one of the technologies that came up in Verge this year, um, a little bit more than normal, which is good, and I'm, I'm glad we had Amber Kinetics on last Friday to talk about them, was flywheels. So, you know, where's the, the place for flywheels and sustainable energy storage um, from your perspective, Ryan? That's a good question. And it's, uh, no one likes the engineer ever saying it depends. <laughs> so I won't but that's your say first it. answer. <laughs> flywheels can fit um, a few different functions. They, they're not a one size fits all right. by any means, but um, the, the best place for a flywheel is when you need an immediate inrush of a, of a lot of energy in a short amount of duration. Mm -hmm. That is a great place for most flywheels. There are other applications where maybe we need a longer duration and um, a slower output. You kind of balance that curve mm -hmm. and, and sacrifice one for the other. That all has to deal with the amount of mass that we're going to put into the flywheel and then the amount of energy we're going to put by, by rotating it. Mm -hmm. So all of those variables start to play into one to, to point you into the certain directions. Generally, it's going to be those peak currents because it's it's already spinning. It already has that momentum that that our, our current grid sometimes demands. So it, it's ready there um, to give it to you, and, and that can be very efficient. Uh, I think somewhere in that 97, 98% efficient. So you're gonna sacrifice a 3% um, hit on that energy just to make sure that it's always there mm -hmm. and ready. <clears throat> that can be built in parallel um, with a battery system that's built to, to go against that. A battery that's built for a really long, slow output duration is manufactured a certain way, and maybe we manufacture that battery without the, the high inrush current aspect. Mm -hmm. um, we can do that. There, there are some data centers now that do that on, on a small 48-volt, uh, 12-volt system basis right now to increase the lifespan of the battery. We can do that on the grid scale, too. Uh, not as common, but it, it is being explored. With mm -hmm. What kind of advantages will that give you on a flywheel? Flywheel is also very good at regulating frequency okay. at the same time. So it, it can give you some other benefits that are harder to explain or 
harder to quantify financially um, until we have those mechanisms there to mm. the flywheels lend themselves pretty well to scaling up like um, you have a, a flywheel that does so much capacity but you need more capacity so you put two or three or five or ten or fifteen or twenty I mean you can put them in an arrays you yeah. can maybe even sequence them so that they can have a longer duration things like that is that feasible? Yep, absolutely. Uh, flywheels, very much like batteries, are, are <clears throat> scalable in that sense. We do have to be careful when we start scaling up. Planning for that scaling now does actually uh, impact the design we do today mm -hmm. for when we're going to, to have a complete installation. If I plan on putting um, just a couple of flywheels for some smaller needs, that creates a what's called a short circuit contribution. That, that spinning device will, will keep spinning just a little bit when there's a fault somewhere else. Same thing with the battery. It's going to provide a little bit of energy when there's a fault somewhere else. Before we have time to, to clear breakers and open up that fault to, to minimize the energy that's being put in the wrong direction to, to ground, which generally starts fires. Mm. When we start scaling up these components, as with any type of generation and storage, Generally, that's going to increase the amount of uh, short circuit contribution that we have. Flywheels, uh, depending on how they're built, can can produce a lot of that, which is good in some aspects. We actually want to keep that, whereas solar and some batteries are reducing our short circuit contribution. Mm -hmm. So you can use it in, in that sense where stacking a whole bunch of flywheels probably doesn't have a lot of applications, but stacking up a few to give you that short circuit current. Mm -hmm absolutely would have um, some value to it. Would there be an advantage to applying flywheels in a distributed generation system versus having them, say, as a spinning reserve at a big power plant like Kahi? Yeah, it, it can happen in both. And should I say it, be, it depends? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Feel free. They, they, they could, theoretically, the they could be, they could work in both, a, in both aspects. Um, it is, Quite literally and figuratively, spinning reserve. That mm -hmm. that is the in essence the flywheel. Well, we we start spinning it. Um, a battery can synthetically produce uh, spinning reserve, but it doesn't. The physics are not the same. Right. That spinning reserve, if it's at a power plant, serves a purpose. Um, it could serve the purpose of providing it out back into the grid, um, but it's going to come from that centralized power plant. Mm -hmm. um, it also could produce its own. Um, reserves for its for itself if something were to come down it can provide enough backup time to bring another unit up when you start locating it out distributed generation wise it serves as the same function um, maybe a cloud sitting and you and you want to fill in that gap uh, maybe we have our own this is i'm just talking kind of pie in the sky sense but the data centers where i said that have a battery with a flywheel attached to it to extend the lifespan of that mm -hmm. battery that could be at our house, too, just to uh, extend the life of our own battery that's installed at our house, which is when I'm seeing an inrush at my house because maybe my dryer started or my washing machine started or a cloud hit mm -hmm. and, and variations of all that. Maybe my miniature flywheel is providing me that, that little inrush I need, and that would be the distributed generation aspect. It'll work both ways. Okay. So let's, let's, let's push that into the sustainability realm now. And I know you haven't done a whole bunch of research because we just started talking about it here while we're on the air. But, you know, when you think about a flywheel, um, it's made of a whole bunch of steel or iron, um, some, probably some magnetic bearings that will levitate it so there's zero friction, um, a motor slash generator that gives you either power to turn the, the flywheel or gives you back power when it goes into generation mode, and a containment system. So... In terms of uh, material costs and um, and recyclability at end of life, where do you think flywheels are on that spectrum of sustainability? Flywheels have a very <laughs> long lifespan compared to their counterparts, and the reusability of the parts that are built for them is is very high. It is still a moving piece of equipment, which brings some people to get get some concern they like sometimes people like their static piece of equipment that's not moving but providing its own function mm -hmm. um, while a battery a conventional car battery it is stationary there's a lot of 
chemistry, a lot of physics yeah. going on on the inside of that battery. There's movement going on. A lot on. of activity at the molecular level. Absolutely. Yeah. So um, what's good about a flywheel in that sense is it's something that we're used to dealing with. It's just mm -hmm. a rotating piece of steel, um, some bearings, oil. There's a lot more to it. I probably oversimplified some and, and undersimplified. Um, yeah. But from the raw material aspect, it's pretty much 100% recyclable. Yeah, from a raw material standpoint, we're very used to handling those materials. Mm -hmm. um, depending on how you're building your flywheel, maybe, you, maybe you're maybe you greasing the bearings, which is something we're used to dealing with right now. And, mm -hmm. and, and in that original definition you gave, maybe, maybe that grease that we were using isn't what we should be using now, and we should start looking at um, a sustainable... Lithium grease. There we go, <laughs> lithium <laughs> grease. Um, I, I bet there's something I'm not as much of a gearhead as I, I probably should be, but um, you know maybe that's already out there too. Okay. Some type of corn, corn oil, something like that. I okay. Know. Yeah, I remember. I mean, just looking up lithium uh, to see what the world reserves were and stuff, and what we use lithium for. The applications I remember were lithium grease, which actually is a really good um, lubricant. Oh, I thought that was a really chemicals. good joke. No, no, it's serious. It's, oh, okay. Yeah, I'm familiar with that from from firearms, from the military. All right. We use lithium grease a lot of times in, in high capacity firearms. Anyway, that and ceramics, you know, and glass for some reason, processing mm -hmm. ceramics and glass, you use a lot of lithium in that too. So, um, yeah, it's it's like where do you get your materials from? How much do they cost? And how much can you go back into, and recycle into other things? So it seems like flywheels are a pretty good, a pretty good um, deal. And then um, Elizabeth Dunn from last week said their first major um, overhaul, uh, uh, operational maintenance overhaul, is 10 years, and it's for the bearings. Yep. So you have a full 10 years, and, and it's just for the that's your first one, and it's for the bearings. So another good example of maybe options of sustainable sustainable options that uh, we need to explore. Now we're coming up on the end of our show here, but. You actually introduced me to another concept that next next time you're on, let's focus on talking about, and that is, um, I, I did during my Verge um, discussion on hydrogen. I also brought up compressed air, and I, I said that in most contemporary instances, compressed air is done in salt caverns or big geological voids that that maybe a continental city might have nearby. That Hawaii doesn't but we have something even better. We have the ocean. Yeah. And if you if you have a, a, a bladder of some kind that's a pretty rugged bladder, and you just pump air into that, I mean, 33 feet down is one atmosphere, you got a lot of pressure. I mean, tens or hundreds of thousands of pounds of water pushing it from all sides to contain it and, and keep the pressure up. So let's talk about compressed yeah. air next time for some other sustainable options. Can't wait. Okay. All right, well, that's going to wrap it up for Stan Energy Man this week. And thanks to Ryan Wilbins from Burns & McDonald for helping us solve some of the mysteries of sustainable energy out in the future for Hawaii. And we'll be back uh, next week with more energy news for you. Aloha for now. See you next week.